Thank you. Praise God. Well, what a joy to be speaking here uh, before you. And as Bishop Hugh mentioned, this is my second time uh, in Aberdeen. And I've really been looking forward to coming back because I had such a beautiful time uh, last time and met so many great people. So it's wonderful to see uh, some old friends and some new faces here. Thank you for coming. Uh, I came, I arrived here after speaking in Paisley a couple of nights ago. Uh, it was my first time uh, speaking there. Has anyone been to, been to Paisley? A, a, few, a few. Well, um, I, I arrived in Paisley as part of this uh, European tour, which actually began in Rome. This time, I, instead of going on a tangled road to Rome, I began my road in Rome and, and uh, took a sort of tangled road to Aberdeen, you might say. Um, began in Rome, then went to London, uh, Oscott College in Birmingham, Portsmouth, then all the way in Paisley. And in Paisley, they were uh, very eager to make me feel welcome, so they wanted to introduce me to a, a Scottish um, kind of special delicacy that I'd never had before. Um, it, it's missing a, a vowel, um, but it, I think it's called iron brew. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yes, uh, I think it's an acquired taste, <laughs> but I did just read on Wikipedia that apparently Iron Brew helped to um, help a British aid worker to recover from Ebola. I'm not quite sure if she actually drank it or if she just puts, put it on the parts of her body that were, you know, injured but in any, or, or, or ill, but in any case, <laughs> I was glad to try it. Uh, so yes, so tonight's talk is my tangled road to Rome. Uh, the talks that I'll be giving uh, here uh, tomorrow night and the night after. Uh, I think tomorrow night is the all ages one and the night after is the young adult one. Uh, those talks will be uh, on uh, my new book, the new Catholic edition of a book that I had originally written as a Protestant, The Thrill of the Chaste. Uh, so, um, so I'm, so I'm, I'm afraid that you won't be getting a lot of chastity in this talk. Not that it's going to be an unchaste talk by any means, but just sort of storing up the chastity for the next couple of days and talking about something that I do speak about actually uh, in both my piece I give you, my book on healing, and The Thrill of the Chaste, but I speak about this more in The Thrill of the Chaste, which is, uh, which is how I became Catholic, my conversion story. So. It begins with my being born into a Jewish family in New York City. Um, and uh, my, I'm Jewish on both sides. On my mother's side, my great uncle uh, was, uh, was uh, a member, uh, a citizen of the British Empire. Um, in fact, he was uh, the chief rabbi of the British Empire, Joseph Hertz. Uh, he was uh, chief rabbi during the um, 1930s, uh, I think early 1940s. Um, but by the time the faith got down to uh, my mother and father, the faith had been fairly watered down. My mother and father were very light uh, observants, uh, the uh, reform branch, branch of Judaism. Uh, my father is a uh, a biochemist. Uh, my mother uh, studied psychology, uh, and um, we were we moved when I was in uh, when I was a child to Galveston, Texas, for my father's job, and it was there that I had an experience uh, that I talk about actually in my piece I give you. Uh, I talk about it because it was a it was the earliest experience that I can remember of religious feeling and really a sense of joy. Uh, here's how I describe it in that book. Um, uh, my family lived in, an, in a house in Galveston, Texas, right on the bay. Uh, as I mentioned, I was about four years old. It was a cloudy day and I was sitting in our backyard looking out over the gray ripples of the water. My imagination turned, as it often did at the time, to my favorite pastime, reading Charles Schultz's Peanuts comic strip. Anyone know Peanuts? Yeah. Yes, good, good. Um, I loved its Charlie Brown character, identifying with his loneliness. One of the running themes of Peanuts was the question, why are we here on Earth? Charlie Brown's stock answer was, 
to make others happy. Lucy responded to this quite sensibly, I thought. What are the others here for? <laughs> there had to be something more to life, I thought, as I looked out onto the water, than merely making others happy. Why are we here? What is the meaning of life? Suddenly it hit me with a blinding clarity. The answer to everything is that we all have to love one another. Love means more than making people happy. If everyone truly loved one another, there would be no war, no fighting. No fighting. As I recall that epiphany, I'm sure it must have occurred during the period when the tension between my parents, which would shortly lead to their separation, uh, was boiling over into heated arguments. Yet, for that one moment, I was like the character in G.K. Chesterton's The Man Who Was Thursday, who, in Chesterton's words, felt he was in possession of some impossible good news, which made every other thing a triviality, but an adorable triviality. I had the urge to dash into the house and share the answer to everything with my mom and dad. But then, even as the urge came to me, a sort of premature cynicism arose. It's too simple, I thought. Surely people have tried it and it didn't work. How silly of me to think adults will take it seriously. Then I thought about getting a piece of paper and writing the answer down, but likewise nixed that idea. At the time, the only extended piece of writing I had attempted was a fan letter to Charles Schultz, and I proved miserably inept at figuring out where the commas should go. My solution was to put a comma between every word, just to be, a, just to be on the safe side. But the real reason I was reluctant to move from my spot overlooking the water was because I feared that in the course of walking 20 feet to the sliding doors that opened into our living room, I would forget what I had experienced. It wasn't just a verbal answer that had come to me, but a sense of the numinous. Even as it arrived, it began to slip away. Years later, I would read about this sense of the numinous uh, in C.S. Lewis's Surprised by Joy, where he recalls similar experiences at, in his childhood that, um, in, that pointed to a kind of happiness, a joy that was just beyond his reach. Um, I just realized I forgot to get a glass of water, a cup, cup of water for me. Could I have? Thank you. So um, in my piece I give you, the reason why I uh, talk about that experience is because um, my piece I give you is a book on healing from, uh, from, the, from wounds uh, experienced during childhood, uh, including trauma and the wound of abuse. And I talk about how important it is to seize on to a positive childhood memory uh, to, to help one realize that God has been loving you all through your life including through the dark times when he seemed absent. And, um, and, and um, I did have some darker memories after that. I mentioned that my parents were arguing. Uh, they did split up. Uh, my sister and, and I, my sister is five years older, and I uh, were raised uh, by our mother. Um, and uh, I did continue to have some positive religious experiences uh, after that. Um, I uh, am fond of uh, thinking of my, early, my earliest experiences of the sacred, which were memories of uh, worshiping uh, in synagogue. Uh, and I talk about that a bit uh, in uh, The Thrill of the Chaste. I write that, um, I, I write that um, there was uh, a lot going on uh, that was very interesting to a child uh, in, um, in synagogue. Thank you. Uh, that um, especially when the, the especially interesting thing about syn the synagogue service was 
when the Torah section of the service uh, began. Uh, the veil of the ark in the wall behind the pulpit would be parted and the doors behind it opened to reveal the scroll containing the five books of Moses covered in an embroidered velvet sheath that bore Hebrew lettering and the image of a crown. All in the sanctuary would stand and sing as the rabbi placed the bulky Torah in his arms so that it leaned on his shoulder as he processed it down the aisle and back. He carried it delicately as if it were a baby until the day when I would become a bat mitzvah at 13 and would read from the Torah before the entire congregation. That was the nearest that I could approach the sacred scroll. Uh, the Torah scroll's parchment, as with the holy mountain in Exodus, was to be sacred, not to be touched except by a special metal pointer uh, called a yod, which means hand in Hebrew. As the rabbi passed my aisle as he was processing the Torah, I would lean over as my mother had instructed me, touching the Torah's cover with my prayer book and then kissing the book with solemn devotion. Um, so that for me was a very physical experience of loving the Torah, loving the Word of God. Um, the Torah was like the closest that we had to something physical um, that, would be, that was the presence of, of God. Um, it wasn't the actual presence, but it was, um, in a certain sense, mediating the presence. Then after the Torah was processed, it would be uncovered and placed on uh, a um, table in the middle of the pulpit. Uh, the week scripture was read, and we all stood and sang as the scroll was returned to its place in the ark, uh, which was a, a shuttered uh, cabinet at the center of the wall behind the pulpit. I had one last glimpse of the scroll as it stood majestically in its home. Then the ark's doors were shut, its veil closed, and the sanctuary resumed its normal outlines, its aura of holiness uh, diminished. I was always sorry to see the Torah disappear from sight, though I couldn't have told you why. Now I realize it was because I longed for the presence of God. So those are some very positive memories uh, that I had of Temple uh, growing up. Um, there were other memories that were not so positive. Um, there were times when um, I would get bored during the long temple service, so with my mother's permission, I would go to the temple library and just uh, read until the, um, until the service was over. And it was there uh, in that library where uh, the janitor approached me. Um, and my mother taught me to be kind to people according to whatever state of life they were in, and especially to be kind to poor people, people on the fringes. I understood that the janitor was someone, was someone who, who was um, somewhat of a, of a different class uh, than, than us, and that, and that I should go out of my way to be kind to him. Well, the janitor took advantage of this, and he told me uh, that he wanted me to play a game with him. And, and the game was his molesting me, which uh, he told me to keep uh, a secret. Now, I wasn't used to keeping secrets from my mother. Um, and uh, I felt very uncomfortable about this game. I felt there was something wrong with, with it. Um, I felt um, somehow uh, embarrassed and ashamed to tell my mother. But I did um, eventually tell her. And when I did tell her, um, her first response, you know, uh, you know, first responses with a child are so important. They have a great um, impact. And my mother's first response was, you let him do that to you. I was five years old. Um, I know now what I didn't know then. I know that no child is 
ever responsible for abuse, for the abuse perpetrated upon the child. And this is true regardless of whether the abuse is perpetrated by an adult or by a peer. Uh, children are to be protected and loved, not abused. And children are not at an age where they can process what's happening uh, with regard to sexual contact. Sexual contact is always traumatic for them. It releases stress hormones that aren't meant to be released and aren't healthy um, for their growing body. Um, I know that now, um, but at the time, I internalized this guilt and shame, thinking that I was somehow responsible for my own abuse. Because I internalized this guilt and shame, I was more vulnerable uh, to being abused again. And uh, later on, the abuse took place at home. Uh, it was perpetrated by one of my mother's boyfriends with my mother's knowledge. Now, I'm not telling this to, um, to um, express anger at my mother. Uh, my mother doesn't remember things like I remember them. Uh, what she does remember, she regrets terribly. Um, and, and I have forgiven uh, my mother. Forgiveness doesn't excuse the abuse, but forgiveness actually admits, it, it, it acknowledges that something took place that needs forgiveness, that a sin took place. Um, and uh, at the same time, even though I've forgiven the abuse, it's very important when living in the love of Christ to, to, to live in his truth. In God, love is the same as truth. And part of living in truth is acknowledging one's wounds so that, so that one can acknowledge one's true identity in Christ, who is the divine physician, who heals all wounds and helps us to be truthful uh, and with ourselves and with, and with others. Acknowledging my wounds was also important in recognizing how those wounds shaped me and how, as a teenager and young adult, I began to act out of those wounds. Uh, my wounds led me to feel that I wasn't valuable for who I was. I thought, as a teenager and young adult, that I was only valuable for what I did, for how I was pleasing to others. So um, I desperately wanted to be loved, but thinking that I was only valuable for what I did, uh, I sought love in, in things that were, that were not love. I couldn't imagine that any man would possibly love me and uh, want to marry me if I did not make myself sexually available to him uh, first. Um, so in my teenage years and young adulthood, I, was, um, I got caught in this cycle of dead end uh, rela relationships. Um, I was uh, seeking permanence, but seeking it through impermanence, through, uh, through relationships that were physical and not vowed, which are by definition without the vow, the vow um, Im impermanent. I'll talk more about this in the chastity talk, but I just want to um, give you a picture of where I was when, when the grace of Christ reached me at the um, beginning of my conversion when I was 27. At this time, besides being caught in these dead-end relationships, I was also suffering from depression, which I now know uh, was one of the effects of undiagnosed post-traumatic stress disorder brought on by the abuse. I was on three different medications for the depression, but um, because my therapist um, didn't diagnose it properly as PTSD, um, the medications that I was on um, weren't helping. And uh, miraculously, even in this time of darkness, God's grace reached me um, in the most unexpected way. Um, as I mentioned, I was 27. Uh, this was 
December 1995, which um, makes me now 42. And I, <laughs> and, uh, I was doing a telephone interview with a rock musician who was a member of a band called the Sugar Plastic, not a Christian rock band. And I asked him what he was reading at the time. And he answered that he was reading uh, a book by this author that I'd never heard of, G.K. Chesterton. Uh, how many of you have read Chesterton? Oh, good, I see sev several hands. Well, you know then what I didn't know at the time, which is that, uh, that I was, uh, as someone who was then um, really not having faith, I was an agnostic um, and, and uh, really living away from God. Um, you know that Chesterton is, is what uh, C.S. Lewis called a trap. Uh, Ch Chester uh, Lewis called Chesterton a, a trap because uh, here was C.S. Lewis trying to remain a sound atheist and then he discovered uh, Chesterton and he was a goner. Well, I was a goner too, although I didn't know it at the time. Um, this uh, rock musician said he was reading this book, a novel, The Man Who Was Thursday by G.K. Chesterton and I just went out not knowing who Chesterton was and picked up this novel thinking that I would have something to talk about with this musician the next time uh, that he came to town. Uh, so I picked up the novel and I gathered right away that Chesterton was Christian, but I was willing to forgive him that uh, because uh, he, the novel was exciting. And uh, it's a spy novel. Uh, it begins with this, um, with this debate between two poets, one of whom is a is a, an undercover policeman. And the two poets are arguing about what constitutes poetry. And uh, the, the, uh, the one poet who's an anarchist is arguing that true poetry is chaos and anarchy. And the other poet, the policeman, who's really a stand-in for Chesterton, he um, says that that to, true poetry is something that reflects an, a kind of order. And th there's this line that he says that struck me very deeply. Um, this poet, who's a stand-in for Chesterton, says, the most poetical thing in the world is not being sick. I remember reading that, and it just stirred in me this longing um, I knew on some level that I was sick. I couldn't have told you that the illness was PTSD. I couldn't have told you that my own sinful behavior was aggravating my, my sadness. Uh, but I was on three medications at the time and still was having suicidal, self-destructive thoughts. And when I read those words, the most poetical thing in the world is not being sick. I felt inside me this longing, this um, real uh, desire to be ordered within from the top down and to know the poetry of not being sick. Now, I, I wish I could tell you that I went straight to the nearest Catholic church. I did get uh, get baptized, and it's, I was baptized the proper way in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, so it was a true sacrament. Um, but I was baptized in a Protestant church because uh, I was very uh, afraid of losing my identity by being swallowed up in this larger whole. And uh, as a Jew growing up in America and always hearing, this is a Christian country, I'd always felt like an outsider. And so uh, I, I really thought that, um, th that uh, if I wanted to keep my identity as a Christian, I had to... Um, find some church that fit me. And I wasn't sure which church it was. I just knew it wasn't the Catholic Church. I thought I'd be ABC, anything but Catholic. Um, now, you know, it is 
funny giving this talk over here because um, when I give this talk in towns, in cities in America, um, and I talk about not wanting to be a conformist and thinking that, you know, that Christians were in the majority and thinking that, you know, the Catholic Church um, especially um, was, um, was just something kind of large and amorphous that I could get swallowed up in. When I, when I speak, give this talk in America, um, people um, are often liable to think of the Catholic Church as something kind of large and amorphous. It's not so here. Here, the Catholic Church, uh, Catholics are the rebels. Here, the, the, the church is more underground. Um, here, the church has a, a very strong memory of having been, people having been persecuted and, and, and martyred uh, for, the, for the faith. In America, even though America went through a very long period of persecution, the Catholic Church has gotten kind of fat and contented, and it's only just now with the, uh, with the coming persecution, which is uh, just about upon us, not a, uh, necessarily a physical persecution, but a persecution of laws uh, with regard to same-sex marriage being imposed. Uh, it's only now that people are just barely beginning to wake up uh, to the idea that, that uh, in fact, it's not safe to be, to be a Catholic uh, anymore. But I was into rebellion and not into something that was safe and comfortable, so uh, I uh, was trying to find my Christian way outside the church. But um, I was getting drawn, just in researching Christianity, and reading the Bible, getting drawn to the pro-life message and to what Catholics were saying about being pro-life. Um, and this was, I think, in large part because uh, of my having suffered abuse as a child. Uh, I really uh, saw that, um, that to be pro-life was to stand up for the most vulnerable, to be a voice for the voiceless. And, uh, and that... Uh, idea really resonated with me. And, but yet I was, uh, sh I was wary of the Catholic Church, especially because I think of the, uh, the whole idea of the communion of saints. I didn't understand that. Um, as a Protestant, I thought that veneration of saints was at um, worst idolatry. And I thought that at best, it still took away um, our attention where it should be really focused on, on God. Um, and so, and so um, with those thoughts, I was still going my own way as a Christian. Um, but um, one day, um, that began to change, actually very dramatically. Um, I, I was at the New York Post uh, as a, working as a sub-editor. Uh, in America, we call it copy editor and a headline uh, writer. Um, one of my headlines um, was uh, when, it was a front page headline, uh, when Donald Trump got married. You've all heard of Donald Trump. Yes, unfortunately, you know, this is one of the things that America exports, greed and materialism. I'm sorry to, I'm sorry to, 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 to say. Um, uh, thankfully, we do export some, uh, some, um, some better things as, as well, but yes, Donald Trump. Well, um, well, Donald Trump was getting married, and uh, I knew that there was going to be a picture of the bride on the front page of the paper. So uh, I wrote the front page headline, Lady is a Trump. <laughs> <laughs> so they liked me at the New York Post because of my witty headlines. But one day I did something that uh, that really uh, changed uh, the opinion of me among the uh, reporters and higher ups. I was given a story to copy edit that was on in vitro fertilization, and I got angry reading it because I thought that the story had a very cav cavalier attitude towards life. For example, the story said that one woman had um, had two embry had three embryos implanted two took, now she has miracle babies. Well, I thought that there's a death there and the death needs to be acknowledged. So I, I took it upon myself to 
fix this story. Um, I, uh, where it said two, three embryos were implanted, two took, I added one died. And then I explained that in, in IVF, there are always more, almost always, often more embryos uh, created than are needed. And these, um, and these um, overstock embryos are either uh, frozen, which is effectively being destroyed, uh, or they're just destroyed. Um, and, uh, and I took away the, um, the term miracle babies because even though every child, including children conceived by IVF, every child is a beloved gift of God, the act of making them isn't so miraculous when it's an act that, uh, that involves manipulation and creating lives to be destroyed. Um, so, uh, so I put all these changes in, uh, but without any permission, and, uh, which was wrong. I mean, it was wrong. It was a sin to do that uh, because it says in Ephesians 6, serve your employer as, as you would serve the Lord. Uh, if I were doing the right thing, I would have gone to the city editor of the uh, New York Post and I would have explained I can't edit this story unless those changes uh, are, these changes are made, and she would have first laughed, and then, and then um, she would have said, go, go copy edit the story, and then I would have refused, and I would have been fired, and nobody would have ever heard about it, and I wouldn't have become Catholic, probably, or maybe I would have. I mean, I guess being, I, I, I guess, you know, taking a hit for life might have made me a Catholic, but uh, I wouldn't have become a Catholic in the way that I did if, if that had happened. Uh, instead, God although not endorsing my sin, because he never endorses sin, he permitted my fault to be a uh, Felix Culpa, a happy fault, as we sing in the uh, Exultet at, on Holy Saturday. And um, this happy fault was that uh, when the story came out with my unauthorized changes, the reporter wanted my head on a platter, and uh, I apologized, that wasn't enough. She went online, found my blog where I was, my blog called The Dawn Patrol, where I was blogging every uh, day um, uh, about how, um, about how uh, uh, abortion is the taking of an, uh, of an innocent life. And uh, when the editors saw that, they saw that, oh gosh, no, not only do we have a pro-lifer on our, on our uh, staff, but we actually have a radicalized uh, Christian pro-lifer, and you know, can't have that. So it was very clear that I was going to be fired. And, um, and I was sitting in my cubicle waiting to be fired, and at that time I was just thinking, I need a friend in heaven. And uh, like a good Protestant, I was thinking, Jesus is, it, Jesus is my friend in heaven. But I couldn't help thinking, I need another friend in heaven. I need a friend in heaven who's, who's been a journalist. I mean, yes, you know, Jesus died on a cross for my sins, but he never had to deal with the wrath of the New York Post. And so, and so then I thought, well, I'm already on the outs with God because I failed to serve my employer as I would serve the Lord. And if I ask a saint's help, I can't get any more on the outs with God. <laughs> so, and maybe it might help. Uh, so I went online, looked up uh, patron saint journalists, and I found St. Maximilian Kolbe. Um, are any of you familiar with St. Maximilian? Great. So, so th those of you who know him know that he was this Franciscan friar who out of his friary in Poland in the, uh, in the 19... Uh, 20s and 30s was publishing newspapers and magazines spreading devotion to Jesus through Mary. The Nazis uh, imprisoned him because of his spreading the faith and standing up for truth and they sent him to Auschwitz during the uh, during the uh, early days of, of the war and uh, at Auschwitz, um, there was uh, another s uh, pr inmate who was condemned uh, to die in a, in a starvation cell, and uh, Maximilian volunteered to die in this man's place, because this man was married, he had a wife and children, and, um, and miraculously, the uh, Nazis permitted St. Maximilian to 
die in this man's place. And w as I was reading this story in my cubicle waiting to be fired, um, I got to the end of the story and I saw that the uh, soldier whose life Maximilian saved was uh, present in St. Peter's Square more than 40 years later when John Paul II canonized Maximilian. And I remember as I read that, uh, just um, getting goosebumps. It was just so beautiful and, and I just uh, burst into tears and I started to talk to St. Maximilian like I would talk to a friend. And I said, Dear St. Maximilian, I'm in trouble. I'm about to be fired. Please pray for me. And the most unexpected thing happened. You see, uh, I guess the question is, what was I expecting? Well, from my Catholic friends, I had thought that saints were just like this favor bank in the sky. So I was expecting, you know, that if anything happened at all, it would be some, like, really out of this world miracle. Like, I thought that my boss would walk in and say, guess what? You're not getting fired. And what's more, we're giving you a promotion. You know, something like that. Or, or, or I thought that, or I thought that you know I would get fired, but then I'd very soon after get hired by the New York Post competitor, the Daily News, and get a better title and more money, which is actually what happened. But 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 there was something else that happened that I wasn't expecting, and uh, and what I wasn't expecting was that when I broke down crying and and said to, to Saint Maximilian please pray for me. I wasn't expecting grace. I felt this rush of consolation. Um, you know, um, having a bishop in the, in the audience, um, or the bishop, I, I need to be careful. I got in trouble last time for making it seem like, um, like Protestant baptism was different from Catholic baptism. So, you know, I've resolved not to make theological errors this time. So I have to say that that strictly speaking, grace is invisible. You can't feel grace. But if it were possible to feel grace, just hypothetically, you know, St. Ignatius Loyola does say that if consolation comes uh, without any preceding cause, then it comes from the good spirit. And there was no reason why I should have been feeling consolation at that moment. Yet I felt that I was at the eye in the mid middle of the storm and that no matter what happened to me, uh, I was going to be okay because just asking St. Maximilian's prayers had brought me in line with God's will in a way that I hadn't been before. And so that just opened up the communion of saints uh, for me. And I realized instinctively what I would later read in St. Francis de Sales, which is that God doesn't have to allow the saints to intercede for us. God could just uh, answer all our prayers without their intercession, but God chooses to let the saints intercede for us because he wants us all to be one in him on earth and in heaven and under the earth and in, 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 in heaven's waiting room, in purgatory. He wants us all to be united in his love. And so when we ask a saint's intercession, these are the saints who are seeing the face of God and it's as though they, in, in praying for us, they reach down to us and, and they try to, um, through their prayers, draw us upward. It's like they're saying, I want you to see what I'm seeing, uh, the beatific vision. That's what I realized and it was then that I just knew that I, uh, that I had to be in the heart of the communion of saints, uh, the heart of the Catholic Church. Uh, so that's when um, I sought uh, entrance into the church. Um, now, there's more I'd like to share, and I guess it'll take about 15 minutes or so. How are you doing? Can you take about another 15 minutes? Okay, if anyone needs to get up, walk around, use the bathroom, I, I, won't, I, won't, be, I, 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 won't, I won't take offense. Well, um, I told you uh, about, um, about uh, how I had these childhood wounds. And once I became Catholic, 
I knew that uh, there was really nowhere else to go. If there was any place to find healing from these wounds, it was in the, it was in the Catholic Church. Um, and uh, I talk about how I found that healing. Um, I begin to talk about it um, in, um, in The Thrill of the Chaste. Um, I talk about it more in depth in my piece I give you. So I'll just uh, read you a, a bit. Um, I, I, I write that um, w even though I knew that the Catholic Church was home, uh, when I tried to find healing for my childhood wounds through the means available to me in faith, I faced unexpected challenges. The most disturbing obstacle arose when a Catholic therapist who had been recommended to me by a friend told me that he couldn't really help me unless I was willing to revisit every single painful memory and invite Jesus in. I refused to do so, fearing that reliving the abuse of my childhood would be too much to bear. Later I found out that the therapist PhD was from uh, a diploma mill. Do you uh, do you have do you know what that is? Yeah, it's it's a place where somebody like writes away and sends money and gets a diploma. Uh, that uh, taught me the value of the old saying: trust but verify. Um, over time, as I learned what the church teaches about suffering, I came to see how, as the Second Vatican Council says through Christ and in Christ, the riddles of sorrow and death grow meaningful. Whatever pain I had in the moment could, I knew, become part of my daily offering to God as I endured it in union with Jesus' passion. But even knowing that, I remained in a kind of mourning over what I saw as the wasted pain of my past, the sufferings I endured before becoming reborn in Christ. So it was one day in August 2010 that I found myself before the tabernacle with an unspoken prayer. I was in the midst of an eight-day stay at a retreat house in Ann Arbor, Michigan. It was my first time praying the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius Loyola. The retreat director had assigned me to meditate that afternoon upon St. Ignatius' reflections on Jesus' passion. So I went to the house's small chapel and began to pray before the tabernacle. My childhood pain was in the background of my thoughts, as it always was, but I was trying to think of Jesus and not myself. That is when it happened. As I prayed, I saw with my mind's eye the Eucharist as though it were at the center of a bicycle wheel shape, all made of light. The wheel's spokes reached out to all the earth, taking up everything and everyone in its embrace and drawing it all back to the center, back to the Eucharist. At that moment, I realized for the first time that whereas God could not change my past, he had done something infinitely better. He had changed me by making me his beloved daughter in Christ. After all, what is the past? It no longer exists except in as much as it is part of what makes us who we are today. Contemplating the light of the Son of Righteousness, I understood that when I am really present for Christ, as He is really present for me in the Eucharist, His healing rays enter into every dark crevice of my heart. It is as though Jesus' precious blood bleeds back into my past, making even my most painful times part of a beautiful story. Beautiful not because the evil was good, for evil can never be good, but because it ends with me belonging to him. So that, that was really um, the beginning of my uh, really finding healing through, um, through a, a deeper 
um, appreciation of who and what I was receiving in receiving the Eucharist. And I also began to get into what I call the rhythms of the sacraments, the rhythms of, of daily Eucharist and regular confession. And I found that these rhythms uh, enabled me to, to grow in the life of grace uh, so that, um, so that um, even though you know, from time to time I still need psychological help because we are, after all, body as, as, and, and mind as well as spirit and God created the body and God works through um, physical helps as well as spiritual helps. Um, still, um, I began through the rhythms of the sacraments uh, to begin to get to a better place in terms of coping with the effects of my PTSD, um, the sadness and anxiety and the flashbacks. Um, at the end of my piece I give you, uh, or actually at the end of the, th of the thrill of the chaste, um, when you write more than one book, you can lose track. Um, at the very end, I, um, talking, I talk about some of the thought processes and uh, reflection that led to my present vocation. Um, I had written the original Thrill of the Chaste, as I mentioned, when I was a Protestant. And in writing this new, new Catholic edition, I wanted to write um, both for people who are discerning marriage and for people who are discerning a consecrated vocation. And in between books, I myself discerned a consecrated vocation. Uh, I've made a personal consecration of my celibacy to Jesus' sacred heart through Mary's immaculate heart uh, in the uh, 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 fe feeling that my, my mission is to live the mystery of spiritual motherhood in the heart of the church. And so, at the end of the, the Thrill of the Chaste, I have a reflection that I wrote um, a, a few years before I, w I discerned consecration. And then I go from that to writing about uh, how I feel now. And uh, it's interesting reading what I wrote before I discerned c consecration because I was quite envious of celibate people. Um, I was writing about um, what does Jesus mean when he says, when he told his disciples, um, unless you turn and become like children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. I write that I think about that a lot because children truly do experience a taste of heaven in a manner that can seem barred to single adults whose desires have matured. They experience the most fulfilling happiness in the love of family and friends without feeling the lack of spousal love that enters into adults, that is the, the feeling of the lack that enters into adults um, in hope of marriage. I go on and I write, um, for an unmarried adult, perhaps the most sorrowful words in the English language are the frighteningly popular expressions, only a friend, or just friends. Only when we are adults do we add such qualifiers. As children, there is no greater joy than simply having a friend at all. Although, this is me writing a few years ago, uh, although I have not heard the call to the consecrated life, I often think that priests and religious must be the happiest people on earth, and not just because polls indicate they are. <laughs> it's true. Having chosen to, not to s seek fulfillment in an earthly spouse, they are paradoxically able to experience shared joy and undiluted happiness with those close to them, much as children do with their playmates. Their relationships are based on a here and now appreciation of their friends opening up the possibility of experiencing a kind of untimed time with them. It is fellowship lived in the present tense, freed from 
the limiting condition that the relationship progress into something more meaningful. So, I hate to spoil the book for you, but the last paragraph is such a beautiful way to end this talk. Um, so I'll spoil it, um, but, but read the rest anyway. There's, 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 there's more good stuff. Um, it's not like an Agatha Christie novel. It won't be completely ruined, you know. Um, so uh, I reflect on the, those writings that I wrote, um, that I wrote um, five years before discerning the call to, um, to consecration, or actually, no, just five years ago. Uh, and I write that looking back, I realized that even as I wrote those words, God was leading me to a vocation where I could better experience that untimed time. It is a new kind of thrill of the chaste. The world is no longer my meat market. It stopped being that for me years ago, and it is no longer my waiting room. It is my cathedral, and every human being is a tabernacle of Christ. Well, thank you so much. You've been a wonderful audience. I'll be delighted to answer any questions you might have now if you raise your hand. And afterwards, I, be I believe there will be someone actually selling my books in the back, and I'll be delighted to uh, sign any uh, books that you brought or purchase. Thank you so much, and God bless you. <laughs>